in our common, ancient commentaries, it is said that a person or a follower of the Buddha should know the five aggregates and twelve bases, eighteen elements, four noble truths, and dependent origination, and also that is seven members of enlightenment. So when a person has a knowledge of these topics, he is he or she is said to be a well informed Buddhist. So during the past meetings we have finished talking about the aggregate, the basis and elements. So today we come to the topic of the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are very important topic in the teachings of the Buddha. Whatever Buddha taught during the 45 years of his ministry is included in these Four Noble Truths. And it is said that there, there is nothing outside the Four Noble Truths which can be known. And once the Buddha said, it is through not understanding, not realizing four things that I, as well as you, had to wander so long through this round of rebirth. And what are these four things? They are the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Truth of Suffering, the Noble Truth of the Origin of Suffering, the Noble Truth of the Extinction of Suffering, and the Noble Truth of the Path that leads to the Extinction of Suffering. So these are the Four Noble Truths. They are called Noble Truths because they were discovered by the person who was the noblest of the noble, that is, the Buddha. And also they are called Noble Truths because they are to be penetrated or experienced by the Noble One. And also they are called Noble Truths because they make anybody who sees them direct a noble person. So they are called the Noble Truths. Now, it may be strange uh, to some people say, to know that there are four Noble Truths in, in Buddhism and not just one Truth. So people uh, always say that there is only one Truth and then mm, different teachers describe it in different ways. But in the teachings of the Buddha, there are not one but four Noble Truths. And truth in Buddhism does not necessarily mean something that is lofty, something that is wholesome or that is good. Whatever is true is called a truth in the teachings of the Buddha. So if you look at the second noble truth, the origin of suffering, the noble truth of origin of suffering is what? I think you, you, you remember our class at the, at the monastery, huh? What is the second noble truth? Attachment or craving, right? So attachment or craving is unwholesome, akusala. It is a bad mental, mental, mental factor, right? So it is akusala, it is unwholesome mental factor but it is called a truth. So whatever is true is called a truth in Buddhism. So truth need not be, need not necessarily be uh, wholesome or good or lofty. So mm, there are four truths, or four noble truths uh, in the teachings of the Buddha. And these four noble truths Buddha discovered by his own effort without, without the help of a teacher. So he discovered them when he, uh, when he was practicing um, 
austerity uh, to become the Buddha. You all know that the Buddha renounced the world at the age of how many years? At the age of 29 years. So at 29 he renounced the world and he, he practiced, uh, he struggled for how many years? Six years. So at the end of six years he became the Buddha. So before he became the Buddha, he discovered at the moment of enlightenment, actually, he, uh, he, he was said to discover these four noble truths. I say discovered because these four noble truths were not his creation, not that he made these four noble truths. These four noble truths are always there, and uh, both, uh, one, uh, one Buddha after another they appeared in the world and then discovered them. So uh, the Buddha before Gautama Buddha discovered the Four Noble Truths and then taught them to people. And then when that Buddha died and also when his teachings disappeared, then these Four Noble Truths were also, uh, they also disappeared. And so they were something like hidden. And then there were many years without uh, anybody knowing these Four Noble Truths. And then the, the present Buddha, we call, we call him the present Buddha, although uh, he, he died 2,500 years ago because we are still in his teaching. So uh, the Gautama Buddha appeared and he rediscovered, actually, he discovered the Four Noble Truths which had been hidden since the death of a previous Buddha. He discovered them and then he revealed them to the world. He taught uh, these four noble truths to the world. So these four noble truths were uh, those discovered by the Buddha and revealed to the world. Now what are these four noble truths? You all know that they are the mm, noble truth of suffering, noble truth of origin of suffering, origin of cause of suffering, and then noble truth of the cessation of suffering, and the last one, noble truth of the path or practice leading to the cessation of suffering. Now, in order to understand these four noble truths easily, I would like to give you an analogy. Suppose there is a physician and he examines a patient. So after his examination, so he comes up with, with his diagnosis that the patient has a sudden disease. So he found out that the patient has a disease. Since he is a good physician, he also knows what causes that disease, the cause of that disease. Because if a physician does not know the cause of a disease, then he would not be able to treat that person. Because the cause or origin of the disease has to be treated so that uh, the, the disease itself is cured. So that physician knows the cause of the disease. And then the patient would ask him, is this disease curable or can I uh, be free from this disease? Then the physician said, yes, it can be cured. So there is, there is freedom from or escape from this disease. Then the next thing is what? What to do to get rid of this disease? So he prescribed or he concocted, I mean, he compounded a medicine containing eight components and gave it to the man. So there is the disease and there is the cause of the disease, and there is the cure of the disease, and last, there is the medicine for the cure of the disease. So these four things. If you understand these four things, then you, you understand the four noble truths. So the first noble truth is like a disease, like the disease uh, uh, discovered by the physician. So Buddha was a spiritual physician, and so when he examined uh, the world, act, uh, actually, the, the world of living beings, he came up with this 
uh, discovery that it is suffering. In order to get rid of suffering, one has to deal with the cause of suffering, and so one must know what is the cause of suffering. And Buddha found out that it was what? Craving or attachment. Yeah, attachment is the cause of suffering. Now, this discovery is very important because the discovery of the second noble truth it made uh, Buddhism unique among uh, religions of the world. Because in, in other religions, the cause of the existence or the cause of everything is ascribed to uh, the creation of a, a Brahma or a creation of a god. But in Buddhism, the cause is traced to attachment or craving or thirst for existence. The Buddha found out the cause of suffering. Then he also declared that there is the cessation of suffering. Because if there were no cessation of suffering, we would be very dejected, we would be very frustrated. We have the suffering and we can't get, out, uh, get rid of this suffering. But Buddha said that there is cessation of suffering, or there is mm. escape from suffering. Then he not, not only discovered the cessation of suffering, but he also discovered the way, the path to, that leads to the cessation of suffering. And that way or that path is called uh, the path with eight components. So it is popularly called as the Noble Eightfold Path. So that means this path has eight components. And in his first sermon, Buddha called this path the Middle Way. So the Middle Way and the Fourth Noble Truth are the same. Buddha called it Middle Way because this path avoids two extremes, indulgence in sensual pleasures on the one hand and indulgence in self-modification on the other. Actually, Buddha followed both these extremes before he became the Buddha. When he was mm, living as a prince, he was following the first extreme. The the indulgence in sensual pleasure. And when he renounced the world and practiced austerities in the forest, he was following the second extreme. He, he, he practiced uh, austerities so that his body became very, very thin and he was all but a skeleton. Later on, he renounced uh, that practice also and discovered the middle way. So. Uh, the middle way is not a mixture of these two extremes, but it is, it is different from these two extremes. And this is called middle way because it does not approach to either of the extremes. So this is the fourth noble truth. It is like the medicine in the analogy. Now, the physician gives medicine to the man. But if that man doesn't take the medicine, doesn't, in, in, our, in our language we call drink the medicine. I don't know what you use in your language. Yes, to drink the medicine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if the man does not drink the medicine, then his disease will not be cured. You may have many medicine bottles in, in the house, in the cabinet, but if you don't take medicine, then you will not get rid of uh, a cold or fever or whatever. So you have to take it so that you, you, you get the benefits out of medicine. In the same way, the medicine given by the Buddha here is the, full, I mean, the noble eightfold path. And this is not for just keeping, not for just understanding, but it is for practicing. Only when we practice the, the noble eightfold path or the middle way can we get benefits out of this practice, and that the benefits the, the ultimate benefit of this practice, of this way, is 
the total eradication of mental defilement or impurities in our mind, and last, cessation of all suffering. So these are the four noble truths taught by the Buddha, uh, first discovered by the Buddha and taught to the world. Now let us go into these four noble truths in more detail. Now the first noble truth, the noble truth of suffering. Now let us consider life. We are getting old day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second. But I don't think there is anybody who wants to get old, who wants to get old, right? We don't like getting old. And when somebody says, oh, you are young for your age or something like that, we are happy. <laughs> but if somebody says, oh, you, you, you have changed or say you, you have, uh, what do you call, oh, you have become old, then we, are, we don't like it. We are sorry for that. So old age, we don't like. Although we don't like it, we will have old age every moment of our lives. Now there are people uh, who are saying that you can stay young and there are medicines or uh, exercises and all these things, right, to, to keep you young. Now, if you follow these exercises and uh, use the medicines they, 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 they sell, you may look young. But what they don't tell you is, although you, look, you, you may look young, you will not be young. Even at the moment of taking that medicine or doing exercises, you are getting older minute by minute, second by second. That cannot be stopped. The, the process of getting old cannot be stopped. So we get old day by day, the minute by minute, second by second. And when we get older, our senses become weak. It, we have poor eyesight or we don't hear uh, quite clearly as we did before and we become weak in many respects. And these are the, the sufferings of old age. And then when you get old, the, the, the younger people don't want to be with you. You will be left out of their, say, what do you call, their doings and so on. And so that is also the, the suffering of old age. So Buddha said, old age is suffering. And I, I, I think it can be easily accepted. Then disease is suffering, sickness is suffering. I don't, I don't need to tell you that disease is suffering. So when you have a fever, when you have a disease, you, you, you always suffer. So disease is suffering. Death is suffering. Nobody wants to die. But one day we'll have to face death. It will come to us sooner or later. It's very definite. So there is no way of escaping death. <coughs> And since we don't like to, be, uh, to die, but yet we, we, we have to die, we have to face death one day, that is suffering. So death is suffering. And then sometimes we have to live with persons whom we don't like or whom we hate, whom we uh, cannot get along with. And then at that time we suffer. Sometimes we have to live in a house we don't like or you... you Let's say you, not me. <laughs> or uh, you have to drive, dr drive the same car say, year after year and you don't like that car. So you are suffering because you have to be with something you don't like or you have to be with someone you don't like. That is suffering. And then to be separated from those who are dear to you, that is also suffering. To be se separated from some things which are dear to you, that also is suffering. Um, Many people uh, lost their houses or cars or whatever, and when they, when they lost them, then they suffered. So to be separated from the people you love and to be separated from things you love is also suffering. And then you want this thing or that thing. You want to, you want to have a, a good car, a good house, a modern house, but when you cannot get that, there is suffering also. Unfulfilled wishes. And also, we, we are subject to old age, disease and death, but sometimes we, we, we wish, oh, 
it would be very good if, if uh, I am free from old age, disease and death. So we wish for that, but we cannot get uh, get away from uh, the old age, disease and death. So there, these are called unattainable, the desire for those which are unattainable. However much we, we wish, however much we pray, we will never get free from old age, disease and death. That means until say, we, we, we become Buddhas or Arahants. So the, the wish that cannot be fulfilled is also suffering. So according to the definition, this, the definition given by the Buddha, everything in the world is suffering, right? But you, you may want to say, sometimes we enjoy life. We enjoy good food, good companionship. We may enjoy a movie, a show, or a vacation. And we are happy at that time, right? So there can be some happiness in life. And so uh, it, it, may, it, it may not be easy to accept that life is suffering. But according to the Buddha, what we call happiness is, in the ultimate analysis, suffering. So in order to let us know that everything in the world, including what we call happiness, is suffering, Buddha, uh, Buddha gives us another explanation of suffering, and that is the five, in, in brief, the five aggregates of clinging are suffering. I, I hope you all know the five aggregates of clinging. If you don't know, you, you just go back to the notes. Now, the first five aggregates. Aggregate of matter, aggregate of feeling, aggregate of perception, aggregate of mental formations, aggregate of consciousness. If you are not familiar with these terms, you may not understand. But. What these five aggregates mean is everything in the world, Every, everything uh, pertaining to living beings in the world. So our mind and our uh, states, of, uh, states of mind say, uh, we, we, we experience, and also our physical body. So everything we, we, we have as, uh, in our life, I mean, the mental and physical things, uh, belonging to us, I mean belonging to our bodies and minds, so everything is suffering. Because five aggregates means just mind and matter. The first aggregate is matter, and the other four aggregates belong to mind. So mind and matter is suffering. And we are composed of mind and matter, and so we are suffering. So everything is suffering. Now, in order to understand this, we must understand Buddha's explanation of what is dukkha, I mean, what is suffering. Now, when we, when we hear the word suffering, we understand it to mean there's some, something like something pain, some pain in our body or some pain in our mind, and that is what we call or what we understand as suffering. But when Buddha used the word suffering or uh, the original word dukkha, he meant something more, not just uh, the painfulness, but also something. So his explanation of suffering is that whatever is impermanent is suffering. So it, it is his criterion for suffering. So whatever is impermanent is suffering. Is there anything that is permanent in the world? No. Uh, our minds, no, our bodies, no, what about the houses? They may seem to last for some time, right? They may seem to last for 20 years, 30 years, but actually every particle say, in, 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 the, in the house, say, in the uh, parts of the house, is always changing. So they are also uh, impermanent, although they, 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 seem, they seem to us as permanent. So, but when we, when we speak about the noble truth of suffering, we are concerned with living beings only, not non-living things as houses, cars and trees and so on. So 
every everything we we have as living being is suffering because everything is impermanent then what is impermanent what is it where that is impermanent anything that has a beginning and an end is impermanent something arises and then naturally it disappears so a thing that has a beginning and an end is impermanent and what is impermanent is suffering so the the happiness we say we, we enjoy uh, when we uh, eat good food when we uh, enjoy good companionship and so on they have also a beginning and an end so although they are called happiness in the ultimate analysis they are suffering suffering in the sense that they are tormented by arising and disappearing <coughs> so one meaning of the word dukkha is that tormented by arising and disappearing so everything has a beginning and an end everything is arising and disappearing and so it is uh, like tormented by arising and disappearing arising and disappearing so it is called dukkha or suffering so according to this definition everything in the uh, everything pertaining to the uh, living being is suffering and suffering in the sense of tormented by arising and disappearing or in other words suffering in the sense of unsatisfactoriness we want things to be permanent we want ourselves to be permanent but we cannot be permanent and so things are not satisfactory to us and that unsatisfactoriness is one meaning of uh, the word dukkha in pali uh, which is uh, popularly translated as suffering so uh, by the word suffering when we are <coughs> talking about the noble truth of and so the permanent and so things are not satisfactory to us and that unsatisfactoriness is one meaning of uh, the word dukkha in pali uh, which is uh, popularly translated as suffering so Uh, by the word suffering when we are talking about the noble truth of suffering we don't mean just a real painfulness and others but also uh, it, it's being tormented by arising and disappearing or it's being impermanent so whatever is impermanent is suffering and so everything say, every everything in the world is a uh, living world is suffering now the second noble truth Buddha discovered to be attachment. Now, when we say everything, everything according to the living uh, being is suffering, that means the living world or our life. So our life is suffering. And what is the cause of our life? What is the cause of suffering? Now, we are born as human beings, and so as human beings, uh, we suffer a lot. We suffer old age, suffer disease. and we will suffer death and also we suffer unfulfilled uh, expectations and wishes and so on all all this we have to suffer because we were born as human beings if we were not born as human beings we won't we won't suffer uh, we won't suffer the suffering peculiar to human beings so the base of all suffering we we encounter or we experience in this life is the birth as a human being so birth is also suffering when birth is suffering then the whole life is suffering now what is the cause of this suffering what is the cause of uh, birth say as a human being or as an animal or a celestial being the buddha said that the cause of birth as being and al- and also uh, the life as being is craving or attachment because we have very strong attachment to our life this attachment makes us do things i mean perform karma sometimes good sometimes bad and when we perform karma then we cannot avoid the results of karma some karma give results in this life 
and some karmas give results in other lives. And so, as a result of the karma we perform in, in our past lives, we are reborn here as human beings. And those karmas are conditioned by what is called the attachment or craving. If we do not have attachment to anything at all, we will not acquire any karma. Now, Arahants and Buddhas do not acquire any fresh karma because they have eradicated all mental defilements, including mm, attachment or craving. And attachment or craving is not the only cause, actually. It is always accompanied by what is called ignorance, not knowing things as they are. So, in fact, ignorance and craving, these two things are the basic causes, basic causes for suffering. But in this discourse on Four Noble Truths, uh, Buddha picked only the craving and suffering. But when craving is taken, then ignorance has also to be taken, because they always arise together. Craving does not arise without ignorance. So when we take craving, we also take uh, ignorance. So these two things, ignorance and craving, are the real culprit that are for our suffering in this life. So Buddha discovered that suffering is caused by craving. The Pali word used is tanha. The literal meaning of tanha is thirst. So when you are thirsty, you cannot help drinking, right? You cannot help drinking water. So where is the thirst for life? Then we do um, deeds sometimes good deeds, sometimes bad deeds, in order to, uh, to get a, a good, good lives in the future. And so when there, is the, uh, when there are the deeds, or when there are actions, there are bound to be reactions. And those reactions we, we experience or we get in this life as well as in uh, future lives. But it may not be easy to accept that uh, craving is the origin of suffering or origin of, say, rebirth as human beings and so on. Because we cannot, we cannot really see, truly see uh, that, that craving is the cause of the suffering, that craving is the cause of rebirth. In order to see that, then we have to practice meditation and we have to get a very high quality of concentration so that we can penetrate or you know, we can see being dying from one existence and being reborn in another. Like uh, Buddhas and Arahants see. So they see being dying from one, one existence and then reborn in, in another existence, uh, just as they, they, they see something on the screen. So they can, they can, uh, they have direct knowledge of cause and effect. The effect as suffering and the cause as ignorance and mm, craving, so let's say here craving. But in another way, it is not so difficult to see that suffering is caused by craving. So in this life, okay, we, we, can, we can see that. Now, there, there was a news of plane crash in Europe. Uh, more than a hundred people were killed in that crash, right? Did you suffer when you heard the news? Maybe a, just a little. <laughs> just a little. Oh, poor people or something like that, right? Right. But if, if one of those who, who, who are killed is your friend, you have more suffering. If one of them is your relative, uh, your brother or your sister, or your father or your mother, you suffer a lot, right? So, actually, suffering is not caused by the death of those persons, but caused by the attachment you have to those persons. If suffering is caused by death of persons, then we have to suffer every time we hear a, 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 a person die. So, the intensity of our suffering 
is determined by the intensity of attachment we have to things. Another example. It may be a little sentimental. Say you have a girlfriend or boyfriend. And then say your girlfriend or boy, boy, boyfriend gives you a, a present on your birthday. You may have the same thing say, given by your parents or whatever. But those two things, although they are identical, they are the same material, the same thing, you have more attachment to that given by your say, girlfriend or boyfriend, right? <laughs> <laughs> that we have to admit it. <laughs> so if that thing is taken from you, then you suffer a lot because, oh, it is given by, by, by my say, dear person, by my sweetheart or something, and you have put uh, much value on it, it's a sentimental value, or in other words, you have put much attachment or more attachment on it than on the other thing. So you are... Your suffering is not caused by the loss of the mere loss of the thing, but actually it was caused by the attachment you put on that thing. So in the ultimate analysis, the cause of suffering is the attachment. If you have no uh, little attachment, you have little suffering. If you have no attachment at all, you have no suffering at all. So the cause of suffering is not the loss of persons and not the loss of things actually but the attachment you have to the persons or things uh, which are lost. So uh, Buddha said the noble truth of the origin of suffering is just thirst for life or attachment to life or just craving. Now the third noble truth, the noble truth of cessation of suffering. When Buddha described this third noble truth, Buddha said, the total cessation of that craving is the cessation of suffering. Now, please listen carefully. Buddha explained it, the, the third noble truth, which is the noble truth of cessation of suffering as the cessation of craving. So Buddha said, cessation of craving equals cessation of suffering. Why did Buddha say like that? He should say, say the cessation of say mind and matter or cessation of five aggregates is uh, the third noble truth or something like that. But here he said cessation of craving is the cessation of suffering. That is because you have to deal with the cause in order to get rid of the effect, the result. When craving is eradicated, when craving is destroyed, then its result is automatically destroyed. So that is why Buddha described the third noble truth as a total cessation or total disappearance of craving. And the third noble truth is popularly known to us as what? Nibbana. So, it is the third noble truth is actually nibbana, and nibbana is the cessation of all suffering. Now, nibbana is very very difficult to even to describe to explain because it defies any explanation. Because we live in this conventional world, and what what words we use for communication with each other is are also conventional. But Nibbana is beyond convention. And so we cannot adequately describe Nibbana. We have no words to describe it. If we if I say, oh Nibbana is something say, which is free from the suffering, then what is something? If it is a thing, it must have a beginning and an end. And so it must not be uh, eternal or something like that. If I say uh, it is a state where mm, no suffering exists, the same thing. If it, if it is a state, then it must have a beginning and an end, and so it is a contradiction in terms. And then if I say it is a state where there is no suffering, then if, if I say where, I'm implying that nibbana is a place. So nibbana is very difficult to, to 
understand, to explain, and to realize. In many, many of the discourses, Nibbana is, is described as some, again, I have to use the word something. <laughs> it's better to give it up, right? <laughs> so, Nibbana is something by which mental defilements that come to cessation. Nibbana is something taking which as an object uh, the mind is able to eradicate mental defilement. So it is very difficult to, to explain. So now just, just let us say that Nibbana is the cessation of mental defilement or eradication of mental defilement <coughs> and the cessation of all suffering. Now, cessation of mental defilement we can achieve in this life if we are really, uh, if we have really accumulated experience in past lives or if we have enough parameda. When a person becomes an arahant or a Buddha, his mind becomes totally pure. His mind becomes totally free from mental defilement. Totally free means these mental defilements will never arise in their minds again.